Okay, let's begin. I've been wanting to do this for a while, so I need to do this as well. So we're going to start with lecture one for the CGSS. Let's begin. So with the governance and enforcement section, introduction. Let's, let's learn about sanctions. Laws, regulations, and interpretive notes, guidance, compliance may seem to be a regulatory construct that is established to create complexity, paper-heavy manuals, and endless reporting. Yeah, we see a lot of endless KPI reporting, especially in the States. And while it may have some or all of these things, compliance, and especially sanctions compliance, is so much more. By looking past the regulatory construct, we see world leaders negotiating foreign policy, cargo ships evading naval destroyers, and powerful institutions circumventing regulatory oversight. This all takes place on an international stage and we are part of this and, and we design and implement processes in the global fight for important initiatives such as counterterrorism, non-proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, and the expansion of human rights. As a profession, sanctions compliance is meaningful. All right. Uh, it may not be attention grabbing uh, like the professions of movie stars or professional athletes. So ACAMS is setting the scene here about how important sanctions is, guys. Guys and girls. Um, it may not be attention grabbing like professions of movie stars or professional athletes. That is true. But the complexity of law, the paper heavy manuals, clarifying regulations and endless reporting are all part of national, international and global initiative to bring about meaningful change. Sanctions are defined as, here's the definition, the ACAMS definition. Sanctions are defined as measures or actions taken against a target, keyword target, to influence its behavior, policy, or actions. For our purposes, we have adopted a practical definition to recognize the use of sanctions as a policy instrument. Okay, interesting, cool. Simply stated, sanctions has three components, an economic sanction, financial pressure. Taken against a target, a state or a class of persons, an individual person or even a function. So it can be against any sort of different official elements and to influence the target's behavior. So make the target, for me, that means make the target change its behavior. Sanctions can restrict trade, financial transaction, diplomatic relations and movement. They can be specific or general in their implementation and enforcement. Sanctions are also referred to as restrictive measures. Sanctions compliance is the act of adhering to the sanctions related legislation, regulations, rules and norms that make up the complex sanctions landscape. So I guess you can say that, you know, it, it's extremely complex sanctions. That's what they're trying to say here, I think. It's just extremely complex. It's more than just what you think. Sanctions is much bigger than, you know, OFAC sanctions. You know, it's, it's way more, and we're about to learn it. That's what it's saying. However, with sanctions, sanctions compliance is not a modern concept. All right. The history of sanctions. While the methods used to enforce sanctions have evolved significantly over the past couple of decades, that's actually a valid point because I think, like, you know, sanctions... And it says here that it's been around for a long time, but sanctions has really exploded in the past few decades. You know, if you look at it from a, from a historic point of view, the nature of sanctions has remained fundamentally the same. One of the first recorded incidents of sanctions is date back to 5th century BC with the Macarian Decree in 432 BC. The Athenians levied economic sanctions, banning citizens of Megara from accessing markets in the Athenian Empire. There were a few reports that Megarian citizens suffered starvation, and some people believe these sanctions led to the outbreak of the Second Peloponnesian War. If you guys know your history, if you did an arts degree with history, tell me more, because I didn't. <laughs> I do like history, though. For most, for most of history, sanctions involved governments choosing to physically block or embargo trade. Okay, we hear this trade embargo is a fair bit intended for another nation. Sanctions began to evolve to their current state near the end of the 19th century within Europe. Peace societies began to discuss the evils of war. This is when communism came through. Uh, this is not a, a history thing, though. <laughs> but anyway, pacifist alternatives. Sanctions were considered an alternative to war. Okay, so that's a key word here. Sanctions are an alternative to war, were considered an alternative to war. That's, that's important. Um, during the 19th century, 1800s, in case you didn't know, 
<laughs> Economic sanctions consisted of a type of blockade involving the deployment of military troops by a country or coalition to block ports of other countries they were not fighting. The majority of naval blockades were used during war. However, Pacific blockades or blockades used between nations that were on peaceful terms, um, you know, amazing peaceful terms, were also used in order to coerce nations to pay debts or settle conflicts. I don't know about sanctions, it looks more like warfare in some respects. Um, anyway, keep going. Following World War I, or the Great War, calls for pacism again gained traction. US President Woodrow Wilson said of sanctions, apply this economic, peaceful, silent, deadly remedy and there will be no need for force. Obviously, obviously military force back in those days is, is pretty brutal. Like I've done a bit of, you know, I've been to like the Australian World War Graves a few times. It was pretty brutal. So uh, the Commonwealth War Graves in Northern Europe and etc. So it's pretty brutal. Uh, others have said that the human and financial costs of military for coercion have become prohibitive. That's probably true. Uh, although the United States never joined Wilson, aided in the establishment of the League of Nations, a president, the predecessor of the United Nations, the power to deploy sanctions was included in the League's covenant. So sanctions were established within the League of Nations in the Covenant. You know, whenever I try to see these sort of documents, these little sort of things, that's where I think there might be a question. That's what I'm thinking. Article 16 of the Covenant authorized economic sanctions and military actions against any state that employs war. Four cases of collective action sanctions were undertaken after the authorization. At le the least successful was in 1935 and 1936, before Hitler. Well, Hitler was around, but just before he got really big when the League of Nations joined with the United Kingdom against Italy after its invasion of Ethiopia. Sanctions failed there because other European nations did not follow the League's restrictions. So they've got some evidence of things not working together. Okay. League members worked together to impose boycotts, embargoes, and other restrictive trade measures against aggressor nations with the intent of bringing about a change in those governments, behaviors, and their policies while avoiding war. The ideas behind the League of Nations resemble the beginning of multilateral sanctions. So... We're going to hear that term a lot, multilateral, multi-countries, etc. Or multiple countries working together to impose sanctions against another country. So that could be a question, definitely a definition there. Multilateral sanctions, what is that? Multiple countries working together to impose sanctions. Cool. Uh, or on another country or target. Unilateral sanctions are imposed by a single country against target. So that could be a good one. What's multilateral? What's unilateral? Look at it that way. U.S. trade sanctions against Japan factored into the decision, the Japanese decision to enter World War II and attack Pearl Harbor. This situation provoked questions regarding whether sanctions were an alternative to war or whether they instead might rush nations to use a military force. So people were questioning it. After the conclusion of World War II, the United Nations was formed in 1945 and sanctions were formally recognized within the Charter of a foreign, as a foreign policy tool. Excellent. During the Cold War, governments imposed sanctions more often than in prior decades. It just keeps escalating, escalating. The United States is one of the two superpowers imposed sanctions significantly more than any other country. It was not until the 1990s, after the Cold War ended, that unilateral sanctions began to be replaced by multilateral sanctions. So that's when, the, when everyone started working together. That's what I'm gathering from that. Intergovernmental coalitions, while the U.S. continued leading within the most sanctions, Western Europe and especially the United Kingdom began playing more active role. So we see that too today. The U.S. is still the main sanctions player here, but I guess it's the most powerful country with the most effects, so it makes sense. The most high-profile sanctions were imposed between 1990 and 2003 by the U.N. against Iraq. Yeah, I remember that. Leading up to the following the first Gulf War, these sanctions cost Iraq an estimated 40% of its gross national product and had the greatest impact on the livelihood and mortality, livelihoods and mortality of the country's poorest residents. So that is the big thing with sanctions, and we're going to talk about, you know, it still affects the poorest people. Since 1990, sanctions have been often been targeted at political leaders, drug lords, and terrorists in an attempt to reduce humanitarian implications that resulted from the comprehensive sanctions in Iraq. All right, that's the history. What do you think? Purpose of sanctions. Sanctions, so here we go, this is some stuff here. Sanctions can provide an alternative to the use of force. They are an extension of a nation's foreign policy to bring about another nation's change in behavior or foreign policy in relation to changing a nation's behavior. Sanctions may be used for, here's the key ones here, three of them. Deterrence, prevention, punishment. So deterrence is preventing it from happening. No, sorry, deterrence is making sure people don't get into the idea of it. Prevention is preventing it from happening. 
it is different, believe it or not, and then punishment for when it is happens. So that's the purpose of sanctions. Sanctions can target geography or activities. Geography, geographic sanctions target specific countries and regions. Well, you have the specific countries and regions here because of the Crimea region. So you've seen this a lot with the Crimea region. It's just, it's not, you know, Ukraine, Russia. You know, you're not, they're not trying to sanction Ukraine here or Russia, but they're sanctioning the Crimea region. Obviously, there's now sanctions against Russia now, more so. North Korea or Crimea, thematic sanctions focus on a particular issue or concern that may cut across geographic boundaries, as in the case of counter-narcotic sanctions. The EU has a historically imposed geographic sanctions in recent years. The EU has adopted activity or issue-based sanctions, as well as including those promoting human rights. In addition to being used to protect human rights and avoid military force, sanctions have been used by the following purposes. Preventing war, promoting democratic values, punishing human rights abusers, preventing nuclear proliferation and the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, the freeing of captured citizens, and the restoration of sovereign land. So we're starting to see, well, I'm starting to see that sanctions is extremely complex and much more complex than I initially realized, which for us who work in AML, KYC, financial crime, and are trying to get on that sanctions, I guess that's good news for us. <laughs> sanctions regimes. Okay, so this is something you talk about, the sanctions regime. Sanctions regimes are often referred to as sanctions regimes, a set of sanctions that have a common uh, theme. Sanctions regimes are either referred to by the issue of the set of sanctions or by the intended purpose of a set of sanctions. Examples, the Office of Foreign Assets Control, OFAC sanctions regime, and the North Korean sanctions regime. So if you ever hear about the North Korean sanctions regime, that usually means the, North, the US North Korean sanctions regime. Depending on the context, the sanctions regime may be limited to one country or multiple countries' involvement. Interesting. Affecting a behavioral change. At their core, sanctions are intended to affect a behavioral change through deterrence, prevention, and punishment in some form or another. All the other purposes of sanctions contribute to this end. Often, review boards or committees are established to monitor the effectiveness of sanctions because few, if any, sanctions are intended to be solely punitive in nature. Rather, they include a combination of preventative and deterrence measures considering that the political leaders who might be maybe targets of sanctions rarely are impacted by those targets as low as economic situations. Yes, yeah, so this, this is the reality. You've got money, you can buy things. Uh, what do they say in Mexico? Money makes the dead dog dance. I, lo I love that saying so much. Um, lowest economic situation. Sanctions that they do not prevent, deter targets from their actions may need to be reevaluated or modified. So it's not 100% successful. North Korea's leader Kim Jong Un is often spotted in a Rolls Royce or Mercedes Benz vehicle. So he shouldn't be able to get them, but he does. <laughs> when visiting other countries, Although the UN prohibits the sale of luxury goods to North Korea, the political elite can often obtain them. The same is not true for ordinary citizens. Other than those sanctions targeted at criminals such as nar narcotic kingpins who are unlikely to ever reconsider what they do for a living, sanctions are most effective when tied to incentives for change. Okay, that's important. Sanctions are most effective when tied to incentives for change such as a resumption of international aid and loans from supernatural organizations. Governments sometimes use sanctions to demonstrate their moral resolve at home and abroad. In 1986, actually we're looking at this stuff at work today, 1986, the US started using sanctions against South Africa that banned new investments from the United States in South Africa. Any sales to the South African police or military and any new bank loans except for the purpose of trade. The US also prohibited the import of agricultural goods, textiles, shellfish, steel, iron, uranium, and the products of state-owned corporations, while the impact of the sanctions and to the extent to which they they quickened the end of our apartheid are uncertain. Definitely made an impact, though. They were important for the U.S. to implement domestically to show that the U.S. condemned state-sponsored racial inequality the segregation of South Africa at the time. It's true. All right, figure, there's a, there's a figure one here. Why do sanctions exist? The sanctions have been used in response to perceived breaches of many different types of national standards. So military, purpose, disrupting military activities. Influence actions, environmental, purpose, cleaning up the environment. Influence actions, freedom and democracy, purpose, hastening the achievement of freedom and democracy. Uh, influence actions, nuclear, nuclear non-proliferation, meaning no nukes, no nukes. Um, human rights, strengthening human rights and labor rights. It's funny how labor rights and human rights are kind of grouped together. I actually did a unit on, on human rights once, so 
Yeah, they're kind of grouped together. Free citizens, the freeing of captured citizens. Yeah, uh, land, the reversal of captures of land. Uh, money laundering and terrorism financing, a reduction of money laundering and terrorism financing. Well, we're all involved in that for a lot of us here. A lot of us here are doing this because we, we worked in money laundering AML. Illegal goods, never had seen much sanctions towards illegal goods, but whatever. Reduction in trafficking of illegal goods, cool. Preventing the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. So that's the big one. The UN's Treaty of Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons, commonly known as the Non-Proliferation Treaty or NPT, NPT, so remember that word here, was signed in 1968 and went into effect in March 1970. On May 11, 1995, the NPT was extended indefinitely. The NPT solidified the international community's commitment to preventing the spread of nuclear weapons. Now, it's not as big as it used to be, but it was big back in the day. Um, now, I remember my dad telling me stories about like Melbourne, you know, they'll have like, Melbourne was a nuclear free zone, <laughs> all this kind of shit. All right. Uh, its goal is to create a binding commitment of disarmament by the five nuclear declared Western states. Well, who is that? I think that's Britain, US, China, Russia, France. They're the main states. I think India and Pakistan have got nukes as well. Anyway, promote the peaceful use of nuclear technology while preventing the spread of nuclear weapons and weapons of mass destruction. The NPT established the International Atomic Agency, the IAEA, to monitor compliance with terms of the NPT. The IAEA periodically inspects the facilities and operations of member nations who have conducted nuclear safeguards agreements with the agency. It seeks to build confidence and trust among member nations, which helps to prevent the development of fissile material for military use. Non-proliferation of sanctions seeks to disrupt the function of crime and weapons proliferation. These sanctions can be applied to countries that fail to comply with sanctions or those who help others circumvent sanctions. So that means go around sanctions. That's a big thing in this. Libya is often seen as a successful example of the use of sanctions in deterring proliferation. Case example, Libya and the NPT. So Libya ratified the NPT on May 26, 1975. Less than five years later, the US sanctioned Libya as a state sponsor of terrorism. In the meantime, Libya, with the aid of Russia, continued developing its nuclear capabilities. The US again imposed additional economic sanctions, so they keep imposing more sanctions. In 1986 and 1992, the UN Security Council began imposing sanctions. In 1986, the Iran and Libya Sanctions Act, so that's a US legislation, that became law. ILSA enabled the US president to further impose more sanctions against foreign companies. So they're going after companies that are investing now in, in Libya. 40 million or more in the Libyan oil industry. Okay, so Libya had oil. The number was lowered in 2002 to 20 million, so they keep pressuring them, keep pressuring them. Despite progress and setbacks, Libyan relations, Libyan President Muammar Gaddafi announced in December 2003 that he would renounce its weapons of mass destruction MMD program. So in 2003, they did it. Libya also allowed the IAEA and other international bodies into the country, enabling these organizations to remove 55,000 pounds of documents and components of its uranium enrichment program at the time. Cool, so they went in and actually got the docks. Maybe they backed them up somewhere, I don't know. <laughs> but they got the docks, they got rid of them. Relations between Libya and the international community began to normalize with relief from sanctions following within a year of Gaddafi's announcement. Libya has been seen as a model for other non-compliant nations with international obligations in May 2005 during the Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conference at U.S. Assistant Secretary of State of Control. Um, Stephen Rademacher stated that Libya's choice demonstrates that in a world of strong non-proliferation norms, it is never too late to make a decision to become a fully compliant NPT state and that decision has been amply rewarded. It kind of has. Libya's done much better even more recently. Other things happen with Libya as well, as you guys know. The case of Libya also demonstrated sanctions to be primarily used as incentives to change behavior and not just punish non-compliant nations. So it looks like from a sanctions point of view, Libya was a success story. It's good. Key takeaways. Sanctions are often a long-term strategy to bring about change as an alternative to war. So long-term strategy. Multilateral. So when you make a decision, you've got to think about the long term. Multilateral sanctions, such as those imposed by the UN, are generally more effective than unilateral sanctions in achieving foreign policy objectives. Cool. Sanctions work best when paired with incentives. I like this. Paired with incentives. Foreign investment instead of only being punitive. That's cool. Diminishing the power of regimes to commit human rights violations. Sanctions are not just about preventing war. The goal of a sanction might be to achieve environmental objectives or human rights protections. Sanctions have been used in response to perceived breaches in many different types of international standards and for various purposes, including the influence actions. Examples of thematic sanctions include the strengthening of human rights or labor rights, the freeing of captured citizens, 
the reversal of cap the, cap the reversal of captures of land. Different regimes are limited by their charters in whether they can pursue sanctions or enforce issues. Moreover, sanctions are also maybe be limited by the support that can be guarded a bunch of nations. All right, cool. In the US, the Majeski Act allows for unilateral san global sanctions to be imposed on human rights, offenders, and corrupt actors. So this is when they start talking about sanctions being put on individuals. Assets can be frozen and non-offenders may be barred from entering the US. This is a big part of Russian new, the, the, the sanctions program on Russian. The act originated from mistreatment of attorney in order to Sergei Majeski and Russian officials when he was in Moscow prison for investigating fraud related to Russian tax officials. The law formerly known as the Russian and Moldova Jackson Vanek Repeal and Sergei Majeski Rule of Law of Accountability Act 2012 allows the US to sanction foreign government officials involved in human rights abuses anywhere in the world. That's the big one they use now. Including those found in the assassination of Washington Post reporter Jamal Khashoggi in 2018. Interesting case, that one. Five other countries have adopted similar laws to the, Maj the Majeski sanctions. In chronological order, these countries include Canada, Estonia, Lithuania, the United Kingdom, and Latvia. In July 2019, the EU Parliamentary Assembly urged more countries to follow suit. It also urged the EU through its own internal processes to adopt the human rights sanctions regime. Awesome. An example in which the UN has been able to act and make an impact under its charter, its trade of conflict diamonds beginning in 2018, and the UN recognized the need to establish trade controls over rough diamonds, the illicit trade in Africa. Uh, diamonds were found to be linked to, they're not in Africa, well, including Angola, Cote d'Ivoire, Liberia, Sierra Leone. Based on these findings, the UN established the Kimberley Process Certification Scheme of Rough Diamonds 2003. Unfortunately, this is not very effective. You learn this in financial crime, this is not very effective. So basically, it basically looks at, um, you know, making sure that the diamonds are from like, you know, conflict-free areas and have the sanctions, but they just layer it and layer it. It's, it's sadly not that effective. If you work in thin crime, you'll know a bit about this. Um, to implement controls on the import and export of diamonds to both certify and control the trade and also create a documentary trail as the extraction and refinement process. So, yeah, look at the diamonds. I love that sort of bit about it, the diamonds, they talk about it, but unfortunately it has not been that effective.